Good morning and welcome back to Truth to Tell. I'm Siobhan Kearns. And I'm Tom O'Connell. Well, this year marks the 40th anniversary of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Since its founding, ILSR, Institute for Local Self-Reliance, has championed local approaches to economics, community, and democratic participation. Well, through research, education, and advocacy, the Institute has promoted independent locally owned businesses, renewable energy, community banking, community broadband, and that's just to get the list going. (laughs) Linking all of its work is a stubborn insistence on another old and often overlooked principle, the common good. And here's a quote from Bill Moyers. I can think of no other citizens group whose work and witness during these four decades has done more to spark the courage, clarity, and conviction needed to save our social contract from the behemoths and bullies who would shred it. Well, we sit here today on Cyber Monday, an important day in the global holiday shopping game. And funny enough, Cyber Monday is just a couple of days after Small Business Saturday, the day after the small retailer tries to compete for the remaining Thanksgiving and Black Friday dollars before they're nabbed by the vulgar marketing and gotta have it selling techniques of predatory statu- uh, strategic marketing. Is so local self-reliance an ideal and practical approach to building a 21st century democracy? Joining us today is the co-founder and vice president of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, Dr. David Morris. Welcome, David. Thank you very much, Tom. David is also an author and a contributor to some of the country's prestigious national newspapers, as well as a government consultant. Our show today, Local Self-Reliance, an old idea more relevant than ever. And of course, you're also part of this conversation. Give us a call at 612-341-0980. That's 612-341-0980. Or post your comments or questions on our live Facebook page that you can find listed under Truth to Tell. So, David Morris, uh, your uh, life really, at least as, as I've, uh, since I've known you, has been associated with this great idea of local self-reliance. How did you get involved in that? When did that idea come to you? Was it a vision? Did you fall off a horse or how? <laughs> <laughs> it came out of life experience. Uh, and and uh, when the Institute started, which was in 1974, in the, we were incorporated on May 1st, 1974. At, at that time, there were more than one billion people who marched in celebration, many fewer today, but nevertheless, it was a symbolic incorporation day. And the there were several of us who came together, and there were several factors that sparked the beginning of the Institute. One was my own experience in Chile. Uh, I went oh. to Chile in the late 1960s. Uh, I was sent there uh, by an organization called the Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, I ended up writing a book on Chile, but I got there about a month after Salvador Allende took office. And so tell our listeners about Salvador Allende. What was significant about him in particular? Well, Salvador Allende, there was, before he was elected, the, the, uh, the, the adage about Salvador Allende, which he told about himself, was that on his tombstone there would lie, there would be the inscription, here lies the future president of Chile. Uh, he had run four times. Uh, for uh, for president of Chile. And in 1958, uh, he would have been president of Chile, but a defrocked priest uh, threw his hat into the ring and got enough votes that, uh, that uh, his coalition um, didn't win. Uh, he was a, an astonishing person. He founded the Socialist Party uh, in Chile. He was a medical doctor. Uh, he, uh, when he was in government, uh, he, uh, he started a, a free milk program uh, including milk bars, anything that had milk in it that mm-hmm. he could uh, he could get to the uh, to the kids. He was a very good speaker. I remember when the first when I got to Chile, the first time I I heard an address from him, which was maybe about a week or two after he took office. He uh, he he talked about how he was uh, freeing. He was letting out of jail uh, the uh, the revolutionary left movement people who had robbed banks. Uh, to finance uh, the revolution, and he he said that uh, that they were nonviolent, that they were well intentioned, but he thought misguided, and they were no longer that strategy was no longer needed. Uh, he thought, and he was going to let them out of jail. But at the same time, he said there are people in this country 
who are undermining the, the security of the country by taking hundreds of millions of dollars in capital out of the country. And those people would be put in jail. Those people he would, he would uh, prosecute to the full extent of the law. And it was that kind of intellectual jujitsu, if mm -hmm. you will, that sort of said, there's a new guy in town and there's a new way of thinking about the society and what was in the bottom we want to put in the top and what was in the top we'd like to put in the middle. Uh -huh. So that was an inspiring moment for you. I remember you coming to uh, St. Paul and working for uh, Mayor George Latimer. What was that all about? Uh, well, with uh, George Latimer, uh, but let me just uh, yes. just say Chile. you know one one more one more thing about uh, about Chile because the 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 reason that that was important was less his socialism than the fact that Chile itself was the population of New York at the time. And I grew up in New York City, as you might be able to tell by my <laughs> hard accent, which has only been softened in the last 30 years, but not eliminated by my residency in Minnesota. Uh, You're and, doing pretty well. Doing <laughs> thank, pretty well. <laughs> thank you very much. And, and the, the, the gross national product of Chile was equivalent to the budget of New York. Mm. And of course, New York didn't, didn't mint its own money, but it had a hard currency. If you earned money in New York, you could go to Chile and you could spend it. But if you earned money in Chile, you could go not go to New York and spend it. It was not hard currency. Uh, and the number of uh, engineers who graduated the City College of New York uh, in a year was more than the number of engineers that graduated all the universities in Chile. So when you looked at it, you found that, in fact, New York, uh, that Chile, uh, had far fewer resources, except for natural resources, uh, than did the city of New York. But Chile, unlike New York, believed that it could control its own future. Mm. And under Allende, for 36 months, uh, they went about uh, tackling the issues of their day, making dramatic changes in the face of a worldwide boycott by corporations, worldwide boycott by, by banks, and the CIA going in and undermining it in every way it could. But to the last minute, they believed that they could control their own destiny. And then I came back to New York City, and New York City was in the process of declaring itself bankrupt. Oh, New York City that. for eight years uh, gave up control of itself to what was called the Big Mac, the Municipal Assistance Corporation, three bankers. Uh, and they, in a sense, uh, ran New York uh, for a number of years. And it was clear to me that there was a conceptual problem here, that essentially New York had more resources capable of controlling and guiding their destiny than did Chile, but they lacked both the self-confidence and the, and the strategic thinking uh, that Chile, in fact, had. And that was part of, of our desire to focus on cities. Uh, and the Institute for Local Self-Reliance uh, initially and for the most part has focused on urban areas and cities because that's where the population is. Uh, it has a great deal of local authority and it has an internal market. So that was the, the beginning. But to switch to, to St. Paul, uh, I was... Uh, I was uh, talking about uh, energy in the 1970s, was a lecture around the country on the potential for decentralized energy generation, primarily solar. Uh, there was a company called SolarX that was born the same time, just about the same time as we were born in, in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. We were in Washington, D.C. And it was the first company to produce solar cells for terrestrial applications. And the first year, it produced enough to probably power one home, mm. although for the next 20 years, it was only used in remote applications. Uh, and, and, but I went out and visited the factory, and, the, and the, uh, Joseph Lindmayer, who was an inventor himself and the president of the factory, took me for a tour. We went downstairs, and we saw the silicon uh, wafers being cut with a bologna slicer uh, from something mm. that looked like bologna into mm -hmm. wafers. Uh, and the manager was, uh, was somebody who had just worked at McDonald's. And when we got to his office, he said, well, do you understand now why, why I'm thinking that when we automate this process, the price will drop uh, uh, dramatically? And I said, well, it's, it's pretty clear that it will. And the very first uh, publication from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance was called The Dawning of Solar Cells. This is about 40 years ago. Yes, it was premature. Uh, but on the other hand, solar cells were in the market, but it didn't become grid-connected in the grid-connected market until the early 1990s. And, of course, now uh, solar cells are undermining the structure of the entire utility industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was lecturing on, on energy. I wrote a book on energy. And in my lectures, I would often share a platform with George Latimer, oh. who was also lecturing on energy. 
Uh, and, and one day we had lunch in Washington, D.C., and I had just published a book called The New City States, which is available if people want to take a look at it. So how, on, can, we, how can we get that? ILSR.org. Okay. Just go there, and, and, and all of the books, really, uh, that I've written are, are available free online. Uh, and it was called The New City States, and George uh, had lunch with me and said, uh, you talk a good talk, can you really do it? <laughs> can you walk the walk? Can you walk the talk? Uh, and I said, well, you know, let's see. And he invited me out to St. Paul, and I was grilled for four hours by him and his deputy mayor, Dick Broker, uh, and a number of other people. And they basically, you know, said, well, at one point, George said, I've got a billion dollars of construction going on out there. I pointed out the window. He says, can local self-reliance produce a billion dollars uh, of construction? And I said, well... I'm not sure about a billion dollars of physical construction, but it can certainly, I think, produce a significant amount of, of, uh, of, uh, of value uh, to the local economy. And, of course, two years later, that billion dollars became a hole in the ground for the next 10 years because of the recession. Uh, and so I was hired as a consultant. The Institute was hired as a consultant. And for three years, uh, we, impl we designed first, and then we implemented what George and Dick called the homegrown economy. And the focus of it was, how do we extract the maximum value that we can from our local resources? That is really interesting. And one of the uh, things we run up against, we've been doing a number of 40th anniversaries and an 80th anniversary of the Teamster Strike and a 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer. And as we do these shows, um, I'm, I'm mindful that maybe some of our audience listening wasn't alive uh, when this was happening. And some people may not even know who George Latimer is, who in my estimation is probably one of the great uh, mayors of St. Paul and, and still is still around and, and with that great sense of humor and humanity. Uh, he is St. Paul to my mind. So I just wanted to fill, uh, we're getting a history lesson as well. <laughs> the other thing that strikes me is for many people, we think about solar as this new thing. Um, and you're talking about something that was going on 40 years ago, right? Yes, well, 1974, now solar uh, began as a commercial market, if you will, to power uh, satellites. Uh, so they were made initially to power uh, 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 satellites, and of course, even though they were incredibly expensive, uh, they were a minuscule part of the overall incredibly expensive uh, cost of, of, uh, of, of getting a satellite up in the air. Um, the irony, of course, right now is that our satellites are now powered by nuclear. Hmm. Uh, right, so we hope they don't fall down. Hmm. Um, so it, it, it's been an interesting arc, but in any case, they uh, were used for terrestrial applications just in 1974, and it wasn't until 1999 that the market for solar in grid-connected applications, like on your rooftop, uh, exceeded the, app, the, uh, the market for non-grid applications, like second homes, like radio repeater stations, like microwave uh, stations, and, you know, you know, and the like. So it's, it's, it's very new in some ways still that it's in the market, but it's exponentially increasing. Uh, and so you know, the first quarter of this year, solar, believe it or not, uh, was, uh, was the largest contributor to new electricity uh, capacity uh, mm. in the United States. Um, so it's really been a remarkable ride, and, and at this point, uh, the utility industry is terrified yes. uh, of this, this thing that people can put on their rooftop, and there is a great deal of both discussion, reconstruction, restructuring, uh, and regulatory analysis about how we deal with this institution that was built uh, 80 years ago in terms of its structure and the rules surrounding it for a centralized, monopolistic, vertically integrated system, uh, and how do we deal with this new, bottom-up, decentralized uh, technology. Uh, and that's something that the Institute has worked on now for 40 years. Yes, we've had uh, um, one, the, the person that runs your Democratic Energy Initiative, uh, is it Jim Farrell? John Farrell. John Farrell has, has been on the show. And um, why don't we just talk a little bit more about energy as long as we're on and then come back to looking at what is local self-reliance anyway. Um, so reading the website, uh, it looks like there is some kind of an agreement, uh, kind of a community city partnership with the city of Minneapolis, the first in, in, in the nation to, to what, to, to develop solar or develop a whole menu? No, not just to develop solar, uh, but to develop a new, you know, to, to essentially do what, 
we came to to St. Paul to do to see that you know how you can extract the maximum value from your local resource base. In this case, in terms of energy, and your local resource base uh, is a significant part of that is the sunlight that falls you know on your rooftops and on your ground uh, you know and the like. But there's also the methane that can come from your sewage. Uh, system. Uh, there's a number of other things that you can do to to generate uh, energy, and it really just means that we should apply our our I- innovation and our and our intelligence and ingenuity to that. Um, but what that agreement was was a formal agreement among the, the the natural gas utility and the electric utility in the city of Minneapolis to agree to work to maximize efficiency. Uh, and to uh, and to maximize a uh, uh, generation internal to the city of Minneapolis, we will see how this works mm-hmm. out. When when I first came to St. Paul as part of the homegrown economy, there were several projects that we started that people might be interested in, not for historical interest but for current interest. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of those uh, was the District Energy uh, Company. Yes, uh, and the District Energy Company uh, was uh, started. I think it was 1980. 1983, uh, and uh, it essentially uh, uh, then there was a fight uh, with uh, with uh, Excel, which was both gas and electric, uh, and a fight about whether it was possible for a city to enable this when, in fact, there was a franchise given to the utility companies. So this was uh, initially a confrontation, uh, and then uh, it uh, it went into operation, and initially it was heating. And it ended up heating, I believe, 80% of the square footage of downtown St. Paul. And then in the early 90s, when we phased out chlorofluorocarbons, and that meant that every time you had to uh, recharge your compressors for cooling for buildings, uh, you would have to pay a very high price for the new chlorofluorocarbons, uh, they added cooling. And so it became heating and cooling. And then about 2002, 2003, uh, it began to use the waste wood generated from the Twin Cities by tree clippings and mm-hmm. the like uh, to substitute 80%. So 80% of its fuel uh, comes from waste wood, and it generates electricity as well as heat as well as cooling. Uh, and the company now actually does consulting with other cities here uh, and around the world. And so that was something that grew out of this concept, really, this framework uh, of looking at a city uh, as uh, from the from the bottom up, the other success story, if you will, was that at that time, I believe the second large brewery uh, in St. Paul was closing, uh, and and I thought, well, this is interesting. I, uh, why don't we see what the increase in price would be if we had a brewery that was one ten thousandth the scale of the Anheuser Busch Brewery in St. Louis? And we went out and we find a, found a brewer. And we gave him a loan and we said, well, start a microbrewery, which he did, which is the Summit Brewery. Mm. Uh, and the Summit Brewery, I think, last year became so big that you couldn't call it a microbrewery any longer. <laughs> right? But still, we're not talking about that big. Uh, and, and I think there are, what, half a dozen breweries now and, my, and, and brew pubs you know, and the like. But it was that same sense that if you look internal to your resource base, what you can find is, A, there are many things to do that you didn't know you could do, and B, that the economies of scale, which people use to justify the most centralization of all uh, all things in the society, turns out to be not all that it's cracked up to be. Mm. I mean, the Summer Brewery makes a, a, you know, a, a, a very, very good uh, beer that might uh, cost maybe 10% more uh, than the Anheuser-Busch beer that, that doesn't taste good at all. Mm. So are you saying, David, that you are actually the person who is responsible, this, some of our listeners are really going to appreciate, for uh, microbreweries? <laughs> <laughs> no. There, were <laughs> there was Anchor Steam. There were, there were, there were several uh, microbreweries, I think two, I'm not sure, uh, you know, at that time. So no, absolutely not. And, and in any case, I'm not, uh, I'm not the person who you can thank for Summit Brewery uh, necessarily, uh, but I am, I am the person who, 
who uh, identified the brewer uh, and got them money and pointed them in the right direction, and then the rest, if you will, uh, is history. And often what we'll find is that, you know, if one city is doing something or one country is doing something for that matter, or one company is doing something, it's, it's been done by somebody else a little while before, or it would have been done by somebody else a little while later. But it is a way of looking, you know, at the, uh, you know, at, at your, uh, you know, at your local, uh, at your local economy. I'm um, just sort of one more story from that era. Uh, I, uh, one of the great resources of a community uh, is the ingenuity of its people. And one of the ways that you can identify those who are, if you will, the most industrious and ingenious is those people who have patents. Yes. Because to, you know, to get a patent uh, requires a great deal of effort. It requires money. Uh, you have to be able to, to, to make a model. Uh, that there's a lot of things that go into making a patent. And so we did a, a search of the patent base uh, to find St. Paul inventors uh, who, uh, and to, to catalog and identify St. Paul inventors, and found out that the United States at that time database of patents was not searchable by zip code. Mm. Uh, but Britain had U.S. patents searchable by Brit zip code. My goodness. <laughs> uh, so we searched them and we found out those patents that were not assigned, which means that most, most inventors or inventions by, by St. Paul people are given to the corporations that they work for. Uh, but then there is a number of them that are unassigned, independent. Uh, and we then uh, invited them uh, to a lunch. Uh, and we, we and the mayor addressed them and we began to t tap in to that group of people that is kind of identified as as having the capability of of solving problems because after all you know you you talk to an inventor and you say well you know what did you do and the answer is well there was a problem out there and i solved it uh, and then i patented it and i hope that i can make money from it but essentially the you know what what i think uh, that my my genius is uh, is is solving problems and those problems for the most part are the kind of problems that you and I would think were problems. These are not intergalactic problems. Mm -hmm. These are problems that occur, you know, in the local uh, local community. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we did, you know, in St. Paul at that time. I think you've just uh, given a great example of why um, sometimes celebrating or at least calling to consciousness history is, whether it's the 40th anniversary or whatever, because it sounds like what essentially has happened is during that very fruitful period. There's all of these legacies that uh, people today in St. Paul, just talking about St. Paul, continue to benefit from and probably don't even realize happened. And so when someone from uh, the business community or a, a, a pro-free market person says, you know, government can't do anything right, um, the only legitimate form is private ownership, we don't have that history that says, well, take a look, take a look at this. Um, this works, mm -hmm. and it continues to benefit all of us. Uh, and so I think that's, I'm just, I was just struck by that, that there's a <laughs> point of all this in terms of re recalling how things happen over time, and then to celebrate them and bring them up to consciousness again against this other perspective. Yeah, government, you know, I mean, you know, in, in, when we started in 1974, I forget the polls, but something like 80% of people had confidence in government and they trusted government. I think in 2014, probably 80% don't uh, trust uh, government. Uh, you know, the, the, the word private uh, in the revolutionary period uh, was, was considered uh, significantly inferior to public. Uh, the word private comes from the, the Latin privar, which means to tear apart and to divide. And, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the businessman who, was, uh, who believed in privatization in the 1790s was called a privateer, mm. uh, which was a pirate. A pirate. A right. pirate, right, essentially. Uh, and the, the founding fathers always talked about the public good and always thought that uh, the private should be subordinated to the public good. It's only very recently, I mean, since Ronald Reagan, you know, essentially, uh, but only in the last 10 years that I think it's become a consensus that the, that the public is bad and the private is sacred. Uh, and that's really the, in some ways, the most, the most difficult challenge that we have is to try to recapture that narrative. And when people think about government, they think about this bureaucracy that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, you know, that, that doesn't serve them well. But government is a lot of different things. Uh, bureaucracy is, of course, one of those things. But what the government uh, does is it makes rules. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I like to use the word governance uh, rather than government, uh, that, you know, that, uh, that we make the rules. And those rules enable or disable 
uh, ingenuity uh, and, and capital and scientific genius uh, to, uh, in, into certain directions. Uh, there's also government ownership, which is essentially collective ownership. You know, people don't realize because there's this wave of privatization going on that there's this was the, that before the wave of privatization was the wave of publicization. Uh, that is, a hundred years ago, in the late uh, 19th century, uh, most uh, water systems, most roads, uh, all electric systems, all gas systems were privately owned, and it turned out to be a disaster. Uh, they gouged the public, they provided poor service, they were monopolies, and they were corrupt. Uh, and so uh, city after city, by 1920, 2,500 cities uh, owned their own electric utilities. Either they had started them or they had purchased them uh, from the private sector. And, of course, water, uh, by the 1980s, uh, 1950s really, uh, was almost 100% owned uh, by, uh, by cities. Uh, and, uh, and those have, uh, have stood the test of time. Uh, municipal utilities, uh, whether they're water utilities or electric utilities, are extremely competitive uh, with investor-owned uh, utilities, uh, and they are within our control. And just one other thing is that when you think about the government as a bureaucracy, people say, uh, well, uh, you know, I really want to want to run your company like the Motor Vehicle Bureau. <laughs> well, you know, people, if you go to the Motor Vehicle these days uh, and you see what kind of service you get and then you call Comcast to see if they're going to, you know, do something with your cable system that isn't working, I'll go for the Motor Vehicle <laughs> Bureau, you know, any day. Uh, and when it comes to Google or Facebook, there is no number you can call. There is no number for customer service. You can't contact them, right? And so it's such a, an, an odd thing that at the moment where you cannot contact people in the private sector to complain about your service, everybody's complaining about the public sector. You know, you're starting to touch on some things that I would love to talk to you more about, and we will get into it in the second part of the show, which is the big box stores and, you know, again, mm -hmm. local self-reliance. Well, you're listening to Truth to Tell here on KFAI. I'm Siobhan Kearns. And I'm Tom O'Connell. And our guest is uh, David Morris, uh, co-founder of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Welcome back to Truth to Tell. I'm Siobhan Kearns. And I'm Tom O'Connell. Our show this morning, Local Self-Reliance, an old idea more relevant than ever. Our guest today is Dr. David Morris from the Institute of Local Self-Reliance. And of course, our call line is 612-341-0980. That's 612-341-0980. Or of course, you can post your comments or questions on our live Facebook page, which you can find listed under Truth to Tell. Now, um, while we went to the break, we did have a call, and it was from a gentleman named Pete. And he asked a question, which is using the example of Summit Brewery, who have... Uh, stakeholders in New York and places like that. What can we do um, to keep the money closer to home here, I guess, in the Twin Cities or in Minnesota? Well, there's uh, many things that we can do. Uh, two of the things that the Institute has worked on and, and continues to work on, uh, one of them is telecommunications. Uh, and right here we are served by Comcast uh, and we are served by Verizon. Uh, actually, uh, Time Warner is uh, depends on where you are. Um, but um, there's a number of cities that are now building their own telecommunications networks. Uh, in fact, uh, when you hear about uh, uh, gigabyte uh, service, you hear about Google in Kansas City. But actually, the gigabyte services uh, were started by municipally owned uh, telecommunications fiber networks. Uh, Chattanooga was the first one to provide it. 80% uh, of all the gigabyte services in the country are provided by cities. Uh, that is by government, if you will, and, and not by the private sector. There are 150 cities that now have their own uh, citywide, either cable or fiber um, networks. And, and once you have that, I mean, after all, cities own the roads. Hmm? They own the, the pipes uh, underneath the roads, as I mentioned, the, the water uh, utilities, that is cities own infrastructure is public. They even call it public infrastructure for a reason. And there's no reason that the fiber network would be, which shouldn't be public. That doesn't mean that the city is going to control what's on it or the city was even going to produce uh, what is, uh, what is uh, uh, relayed over the telecommunications networks, but they would make the rules. And not only would they make the rules, but the money would stay local. Uh, and so if you think about the amount, you know, that you pay uh, for, you know, cable, uh, for internet, for example, uh, and how much of that stays in the city versus how much stays in the city uh, in Chattanooga or in Lafayette 
uh, Louisiana or in, in many small uh, cities uh, in, uh, in, uh, you know, in Minnesota, uh, it's, uh, it's hundreds of millions of dollars mm-hmm. a year that sort of changes direction. Uh, one other thing that we've worked on is the issue of sports, uh, which is near to dear to most Americans' uh, hearts. Uh, back in 19, I guess it was 84, was it? Uh, that the Minnesota uh, Twins, uh, the, the baseball team, uh, and Cal Griffiths was uh, reluctant to go inside to play baseball. He thought that was anathema, but he was persuaded to do that. And they said that uh, if after three years we have not gotten a million uh, fans uh, a year, that that's your escape clause, and you could leave. And after three years, we did not have a million uh, people a year, because who would watch baseball in the Metrodome? Uh, except that it's very loud, we found out. So we won two World Series because it's very loud. Uh, but nobody really wanted to watch a baseball game inside on, on, on a carpet. Uh, and so he was going to exercise his escape clause. And uh, there was a civic coming together, which was perfectly Minnesota. I was new to Minnesota, mm-hmm. but it was perfectly Minnesota, uh, which is that uh, people put together money to buy a million tickets, which I think was $5 million, $8 million, something like that at the time. And at the time, I, I talked to, to Mayor Latimer, and, and I said, well, you know, for $5 million, you could buy the team. It wouldn't cost $5 million. At that time, it would cost $30 million. But for $5 million in cash, you know, you could buy the team. Uh, and the answer was, ooh, that, you know, that's, you know, government ownership of a, you know, of a sports team. My goodness. Well, the Twins are now worth $600 million, $800 million, something like that. And we put something like $400 million, three, $400 million into them of public money to build them, you know, a new sports stadium. Well, back in 1920, when the National Football League was started, uh, there was a team that was financed by local people uh, putting in $20 a piece uh, and buying stock. And that, of course, was the Green Bay Packers. Mm. And interestingly enough, on your stock certificate, it said to you that you had the perfect right to cash it in, you know, at any time you wanted. If you wanted to sell it to, uh, to uh, you know, some prince in Saudi Arabia, you know, you could do that. Um, but the money, the money would have to go to building a monument at the local American Legion because it was right after World War I that this had occurred. So you couldn't benefit from it. I mean, it wasn't as if you could buy it for $20 and sell it for $10,000, right, which is really what it would be worth, you know, on the market these days. Uh, because, and so by that token, it meant that the, it wasn't going anywhere. Hmm? Green Bay Packers. Now, the Green Bay Packers built a new stadium a few years ago, and they had a referendum. They had a local referendum, and they won. I'm not sure about what I'm about to say, but I think that there has been no local sports referendum in the country about public money being used to build a new arena or a new stadium or a new field that has won. And in fact, as we know, in Minnesota, uh, often it's ignored. Uh, the same thing happened in Wisconsin. Uh, or you don't have one you know, at, you know, at, at any time. Um, so the Green Bay Packers it was interesting that in the two uh, Super Bowl games that I was watching that the Green Bay Packers were in, this is recently, uh, you know, in, in a Super Bowl uh, game, uh, you, you talk about everything. And in the lead up to the game, everything, everything. You talk about the wives and the kids and the do they play banjo and where do they come from and is there a mascot and what are the uniforms and are they sewed? Da, 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 da. The only thing that they didn't talk about in those two uh, world uh, uh, Super Bowls was the fact that they were community owned. Hmm. Uh, and in 1962, the National Football League signed its first contract with CBS uh, for a media contract. And the contract itself was at this point would seem to be pittance but at that point it was enough to cover all of the salaries of all of the players at that time so it meant that essentially the owners made profits on everything else right uh and the national football league realized at that point that because there was it was going to be so lucrative and because they were willing to share you know national football league is a socialist operation they share their 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 media revenues that there could be more green bays that more small cities could in fact build their own teams and they could survive because of the shared revenue. And so in 1963, they changed their bylaws so that there could be no more nonprofit uh, football teams. There could be no more uh, Green Bays, which is why it's the only football team, you know, that exists. Um, but that, you know, so, so if you look at the, what is it, 1.5, I think, billion dollars just in the last four years of public money we put into the Gopher Stadium, we put into the Vikings, you know, we put into the, you know, 
twins, I mean, an astonishing, you know, amount of money, uh, none of which is going to be helpful in terms of the local economy, uh, really. Uh, we're going to get to root for a sports team uh, that we consider local. Uh, but it, but it's, you know, so it's, it's that type of thing. So if you think about something like telecommunications and cities owning their own basic infrastructure or sports and, and the community, it doesn't have to be the city government, but the community owning its own uh, sports team. And in the minor leagues, many sports teams are owned by the uh, county or, you know, or by the city. That's a way that you can keep money locally. Now, I do have a question just related to that, which is, you know, the idea, at least this is what the public comment is or the public conversation is that if you build a stadium, you're going to be bringing people in, such as the Super Bowl. So you're going to be bringing people in, they're going to start spiking the economy. And what is counterintuitive to me is that you actually, you know, from the Institute of Self-Reliance, believe that when you bring in fast food uh, industry into a community, it's it doesn't actually give people jobs. It actually, the unemployment rate decline. Um, Increases. increases sorry yeah so can you explain this because when we talk about this this is one of the selling points for some of the major stadiums and and some of the reasons why this was done is to start boosting the economy sure and i think excellent question when you talk about the retail sector which is different from the manufacturing sector when you talk about the resale sector what you find is that there's a limited amount of dollars out of your discretionary income that go to entertainment or to retail and if you then, if you do something in that retail, like, for example, you bring in a big box store, the retail sector didn't expand. What happened is that the dollars that were going to local businesses, you know, now go to the Walmart or to the Home Depot or, the, or to the Target, for that matter. Uh, and so you've just shifted that money around, but you've done it in a way that has been pernicious, that has undermined uh, the local economy. Uh, and the same thing occurs in terms of sports stadiums. You know, people who wouldn't otherwise go to a sports stadium uh, would spend their money, most of them would spend their money locally in some other way. They'd go to a movie, they'd go to theater, they would go wherever it is that they happen to go uh, in local entertainment. Uh, and so you really don't increase, I mean, the studies are very clear on this. You do not increase uh, your, your, your economic, your economy uh, if you build, you know, a stadium. It is purely psychological. And if people want to spend, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of public, you know, money, so you psychologically can identify uh, with a team, you know, that plays, what, you know, eight games, uh, you know, a year, you know, in that stadium, most of whose players don't live here, um, you know, you can you can do that. I mean, it's, uh, the public, you know, can do that, but it's not for economic purposes. The Super Bowl is something a little bit different. Super Bowl does bring people in from outside uh, uh, of the state, uh, and, and they do spend money, and there's media attention and the like, but the Super Bowl also has a lot of costs attached to it. It has police, it has protection, it has a lot of other things, you know, uh, that, that are attached to it, and, and the stuff Studies that have been done, you know, indi indicate that the Super Bowl, if it has any um, significant economic uh, impact locally, it is on hotel chains. Uh, it is not on your local businesses. It does not provide, you know, jobs except for, you know, making beds and the like, you know, in the hotels. Uh, and for most of the studies would indicate that it's really a wash when it comes to the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, so, no, I mean, on retail, and that's what's important. You know, to uh, you know, to to understand when we were in D.C. in the middle 1970s or so, the Economic Development Office in the District of Columbia was promoting fast food restaurants, and the mayor was going to ribbon cuttings of a new McDonald's that opened up, and it just happened that one of our staff people was teaching a night course uh, in economics, and one of his students was a woman accountant for the local McDonald's. And so as her class project, uh, she looked at the books and, just, and figured out how much money that you spent in the local, local McDonald's left the local area, not just the neighborhood, not just the city, but the entire region. Uh, and it turned out, I believe it was something like uh, 70 cents on the dollar. See, a lot of these the McDonald's, area. though, or a lot of these stores, uh, n n except the big box retailers, um, some of these, though, are franchises. So they're actually owned by people who live around in the area. So they have the franchise fee, and then they have, you know, whatever percentage of the commission that they have to pay up. But at the same time, can you see that, you know, it has changed the way communities are over time by, you know, people patronizing these places? Yes. Uh, and, you know, there are franchises and there are franchises, right? And in some franchises, the, you know, you, you own nothing. Uh, but in a McDonald's franchise, it, it may be uh, locally owned, 
uh, but you're going to have central accounting, you're going to have central advertising, you're going to have central uh, lawyers, you're going to have to buy all of your products from a central facility. I mean, you know, you know, the 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 idea of ownership there um, gets a little blurry, you know, frankly. But in terms of the economy, it's really not uh, not you know n- you know not a good deal. Um, but w- you know, we're increasingly an, an absentee owned you know community i mean you know and 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 this is problematic and what's fascinating to me is that the american people seems to be a majority i hope it's not a consensus uh, seems to think that that's just fine maybe they would prefer that we were locally owned but the feeling is that in a modern society there are economies of scale bigness does is is more efficient uh, and if you try to put restrictions on capital uh, we'll all go to hell and so it's okay if uh, foreign countries and foreign companies you know own most of the productive capacity of the united states i've always thought that uh, you know the china uh, you know ultimately is going to defeat us by buying us hmm. uh, because it's allowed to right i mean you know and now if we wanted to go and buy china we would not be allowed to that's the thing about the chinese government and the chinese economy you can't come in there you know and buy chinese companies uh, they they, they they, uh, it's not that they don't permit it; it's that that they don't allow it. Essentially, they won't. You know, it, it's unworkable. Whereas in the United States, you want to buy us, you can go ahead and buy us. And so, I think that that's essentially going to be how the United States becomes a colony of another uh, large country. Okay. Along those lines, I wanted to ask you about, about two kind of um, areas of your work. One is small, locally owned, privately owned businesses, uh, both in cities and in rural areas. Uh, and I know that's been a major focus area for, for you and your organization. How is that going? Um, is, is there been uh, a real uptick in, in small uh, support for small businesses? Isn't there something called Small Business Saturday now to kind of be an alternative to, you know, Black Friday and all those other things. How do you assess that work? Because I know it's a big part of your work. Uh, yes, and and Stacy Mitchell, who's yes. uh, who's who's now our, our co-director, uh, who has re- replaced me, but is also the program initiative director for the independent businesses and community economy, uh, is uh, is is one of the primary spokespeople uh, in that area. The entire buy local. A community is a buy local community, which essentially means buy from your local farmers, buy from your local restaurants, buy from your local uh, retail stores. Uh, there, there is a, a an uptick in the number of, for example, uh, uh, independent uh, bookstores uh, in the last few oh, years. Oh, really? Independent hardware stores uh, in the last few years, uh, and so you you are. It's not so much you're seeing a major turnaround as that you have stopped the the hemorrhaging. Uh, if you will, mm-hmm. and that people are beginning to reassess where they spend their money, um, you know. But right, right now, what you find is that uh, you know Walmart is under attack for a lot of different reasons. I mean, Walmart is one of the more pernicious uh, organizations, you know, in the country, uh, and people, I think, you know, begin to recognize that. Uh, but the other one is Amazon, mm-hmm. you know, and Walmart is a bricks and mortar uh, uh, tyranny, and Amazon mm-hmm. is a uh, is uh, internet. Uh, tyranny uh, and Amazon by 2020 will have more sales than Walmart uh, will, um, and and I don't know how many of my friends say, well, that's you know that's all well and good, but it's so convenient. Mm. It's uh, Amazon is so convenient. Yes, it is so convenient. You know, and uh, I mean, it turns out that you know the tyranny uh, is is convenient. Uh, but it is still tyranny, and what we have found out about Amazon is that Jeff Bezos takes those prisoners, uh, and they will exercise their 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 corporate power uh, in extremely dangerous ways. Whether it's for their workforce, their sort of temporary workforce in their warehouses who are exhausted by the heat, uh, or it's their uh, it's their uh, independent uh, booksellers, you know, who they've decided uh, that are not giving them as much as they want as their cut. That is, this is Amazon, uh, so they disappear their books, you know. As Essentially, you can't mm. you can't find them on their website, um, and this is I mean it's extremely dangerous. And there was a time in American history where we had an antitrust law that we enforced in order to enable local and small and competition. In the last thirty years, our antitrust law is only used when it will reduce prices. And so if you can make an argument that Amazon, which is, I think, has 80% of all retail uh, online sales, you know, in the country, uh, that Amazon lowers your prices, then Americans say, well, that, that's fine. Yeah. Why would we break them up? But there was a time in American history where you broke them up because they were too big and they were too powerful, and that spills over into the political arena. And, of course, Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post is a spilling over into the political arena, as you can imagine. So... 
let, let me uh, ask you uh, um, just a few questions, ticking off the list of um, things that uh, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance is doing and relating to all that we've discussed so far, and just get a quick response. North Dakota, Walmart uh, putting a lot of money into a referendum that somehow would impact uh, local uh, pharmacies. Can you tell us what that is? Yes. Um, North Dakota is the only state in the country uh, that has a law that essentially prohibits absentee-owned pharmacies. Uh, and the independent pharmacy you know, organization came to the Institute for Local Self-Reliance uh, because Walmart was pouring millions and millions of dollars into an initiative uh, to overturn that law. Uh, and we did a, a report that essentially um, gave chapter and verse on why, in fact, the uh, pharmacy situation in North Dakota was better than the pharmacy situation in South Dakota, which did not have uh, that law. And in November, in the initiative, the good citizens of North Dakota defeated the initiative 59 to 41. It was wow. an astonishing defeat. Uh, and the the people in, in uh, who were trying to defend the law were outspent by anywhere from 10 to 50 times by, uh, by Walmart, and yet they, uh, they, they were victorious. And so we're very proud of the citizens of North Dakota and for the small part that we played in that. That's great. So this is one indication that when you take these issues to the people, um, they may actually support um, local self-reliance and uh, local independence. Yes, and, and, and uh, in the election, what we found out is that when Democratic issues were on the ballot, they won. When Democratic candidates were on the ballot, they lost, That's which is an instructive tale. Right. Uh, every minimum wage initiative in the country, and uh, half of those were in r red states, uh, won. Uh, in, in Colorado, they had a law that said that you municipalities could not own their own telecommunications networks, but if there was a referendum, local referendum, people could regain that power. There were eight referendums in November uh, in cities and counties where they voted 80% in favor of the Republican candidate for Congress and voted by an equal measure to regain their authority to, in fact, build their own municipally owned telecommunications network. So let's go to that real quickly. I just saw a piece in the paper about a fund that's being released to local communities, uh, private and public and cooperatives and all manner of or uh, ownership structures around the state would be able to apply for some money to build up their um, broadband systems. Yes, yes. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a good development. It's a good step. It's not nearly enough money, mm -hmm. um, you know, frankly. But yes, it's, uh, it, this is the state legislature in Minnesota has developed this fund uh, to uh, to help communities get uh, significant broadband. I'm not sure that it's only uh, restricted uh, to public or, or cooperatively owned or nonprofits, but that may be true. No, I, just, I think the key point was a mix of ownership uh, structures were allowed. And, and do you know uh, if there are many communities uh, uh, opting for some form of cooperative or public ownership or... Or is it mostly private development occurring in uh, broadband? Well, it, de it depends. The Institute just came out, and once again, ILSR.org, and you can get all information that we've ever published you know, online. And about a month ago, we published a report on Minnesota in terms of its telecommunications work, and we highlight communities uh, that are, in fact, uh, adopting either a cooperatively owned or a municipally owned or a nonprofit owned uh, structure. Uh, and so people in Minnesota... Uh, would be interested uh, probably in taking a look at what's going on here. Now, in Kentucky, um, on that website, by the way, if you ever have a cold and feel like you really don't want to go to work, just park yourself on, onto your computer and you can spend <laughs> days uh, in, in sort of uh, individualized education on these subjects. It's a fantastic resource, and I hope many, many more people will use it. In Kentucky, can't remember the town, uh, citizens actually supported the municipality selling gasoline. Now, that sounds pretty socialistic uh, for a red state. Uh, yes, indeed. It was. Uh, yes, they did. They supported uh, the, 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 what, what, what happened, essentially, was that this was a city uh, that owns its own natural gas company, then built its own natural gas pipeline. This was a number of years ago. And then a couple of years ago, the, the mayor announced that the citizens of the city were paying 50% uh, higher prices than people just 10 miles away. Uh, and he felt that they were being gouged uh, by not the local gas stations as much as the oil refineries. The oil refineries, essentially, it's completely dominated by Marathon uh, Oil Company uh, in, in Kentucky. Uh, and so the city set up its own retail gasoline station. 
Now, it was no frills. They didn't have a convenience store. They didn't sell premium gasoline. They didn't uh, check your oil. Mm. Uh, but you could go there. Uh, and they did that in July, I think, was when they started. Uh, and within days, literally, there was price parity. Uh, that is, all the other gas stations uh, effect- effectually uh, met their price. And the mayor said, look, he says, I, I don't want to be, I don't want the city to be in the, in the business of, uh, of, of selling gasoline, but we'd want to be a benchmark here. We don't want to be unfairly treated. Um, so that's a situation where you have, once again, a red state, a conservative city, a Republican mayor, uh, who uh, you know is saying, look, the, the the government can be used to protect the people. That's what it's supposed to be uh, used, you know, to do. And in this case, protecting the people means uh, selling some gasoline. Mm-hmm. One of the interesting uh, issues, I think, is the relationship between the federal government and the states. Federalism. And I know you've written, written about this, but also the state and local communities. A uh, number of states have uh, pushed for somehow restricting the ability, let's say, of a local community to uh, have a, uh, raise a minimum wage or provide sick leave or, or regulate cable in different ways. All the issues we're talking about. What's your, what's your idea about uh, the relationship between local communities and, let's say, state government? Yes, preemption, you know, since the Institute was, was started in 1974, there's been more and more preemption by higher levels of government on, on lower levels of government. Uh, state governments are, are prohibiting uh, local governments from, uh, from raising the minimum wage, from having a livable wage uh, in a number of different ways. The federal government is, prohibit- is uh, preempting uh, state governments uh, in many areas, and of course, uh, trade agreements uh, are beginning to preempt uh, national governments. Um, from protecting their own. And our feeling is that decisions should be made. We, we adopt the principle of subsidiarity, which is really a medieval principle uh, that says that decisions should be made at the lowest place possible. And higher levels of government do have a, 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 a reason for being. And the, the, uh, the exercise of power by higher levels of government should be to defend minorities, to defend civil rights. You know, because if we're going to give local authority, there is going to be a minority, and the minority is often a racial minority or an ethnic minority, and there's the tyranny of the majority, and higher levels of government should, in fact, uh, enforce the Bill of Rights. Thank you. See, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave the conversation there. You're listening to Truth to Tell on KFAI. I'm Siobhan Kearns. And I'm uh, Tom O'Connell. Our show today, Local Self-Reliance, an old idea more relevant than ever. Our guest today, Dr. David Morris. Thanks for coming in, David. A really enlightening conversation. Author and the founder of the Institute of Local Self-Reliance. And we want to thank everyone who helped make this show possible today, Tom O'Connell, our producer, and to our volunteers, and to you, our listener and supporters, who helped make all this possible. You have been listening to Truth to Tell, which is a co-production of Civic Media Minnesota and KFAI. Links to audio and video archives of this and past shows are up on Truth to Tell's own website, truthtotell.org, as well as on kfei.org. And we'll be back next week with another edition of Truth to Tell. From me, Siobhan Kearns, on behalf of the professor over here, thanks for listening. And for our good friend, Andy Driscoll, we'll remind you to do take care of each other.